Okay, we are now streaming. And I am still not seeing Trustee Barilla popping in. She oh, there he is. Up. Perfect. I'm going to hit record. And you all are good to go. Wonderful. Well, thank you all again. Um, and to members of the public joining as well. Thank you. A, I call this regular meeting of the Silverton Board of Trustees to order on May 11th, 2020 at 7.04 p.m. Uh, roll call, please. Trustee Barella? Trustee Harper? Present. Trustee Wagert? Here. Trustee Beerma? Trustee Lashley? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Barney? Here. Mayor Furman? Here. Administrator Ryder, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Certainly. All at once, I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands. One nation. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Amen. Thank you. All right. Um, as we discussed the last meeting, I'll just remind everyone that uh, we have all the same protocols that existed before, um, but we were not going to read them at the beginning of each meeting unless there is a reason to going forward. Uh, I will also remind all members of the public that for purposes of public comment tonight, everyone will be limited to three minutes and that this is not a forum where we engage in back and forth during public comment. We'll receive the comment and uh, later on this evening, we're actually going to have a conversation about the communication and PR policies where we'll hopefully address some of the, the ways that we will be able to get back to you in response to your public comment. Um, with that, we move to the staff and or board revisions to the agenda. Um, I had a couple little ones, but I'll, I'll ask if others saw anything. Mayor Furman, if uh, pleases the board, we, <laughs> I don't know how we missed this, but number one on the agenda will be eliminated going forward and we won't make reference to Mayor Tookie anymore. <laughs> uh, sorry about that. And then in 9C, this will be the first reading of uh, the employee RV ordinance. Wanted to make that note. Thank you very much. That covers my comments as well. Um, this I had a poem. It's very short and I thought it would be helpful for us if I can add the poem. Um, at what part of the agenda would you like oh, to add sorry. the poem? Um, right before, right after this, right before public comment. Uh, is anyone opposed? Wonderful. Well, we look forward to that poem uh, in just a moment. Trustee Birma? Uh, I was just going to see if it'd be able to potentially split the public comment into before and after the OEM. Uh, just then people could ask specific questions relating to anything that the OEM brings up. As opposed to waiting until the end of the meeting, uh, or, or in addition to, or yeah, in addition to, because then we could wouldn't have to ask questions about what they might potentially cover. Any opposed? So we will um, we will have public comment before and after the OEM report this evening. Any other requested revisions to the meeting agenda? <clears throat> In which case we will move on to our first of three this evening public comment periods. So if there's anyone participating in Zoom that would like to make a public comment, 
uh, there's a raise hand button on your screen. Please click that to indicate to us that uh, you'd like to make a comment so that we can unmute you. I don't see anyone raising hands, so um, why don't we move straight into the OEM presentation. And uh, just as a quick reminder, even though we just said it, following this presentation, we'll do another public comment period and then one at the end of the meeting as well. Uh, Jim, Becky, Dan, Sheriff Conrad, please take it away. Okay, great. Uh, thanks everyone. Uh, Jim Donovan, Emergency Manager for San Juan County and just have our OEM team here, uh, Becky Joyce, Public Health, and Deanne Gallegos, Public Information Officer, and Sheriff Conrad, the Sheriff. So um, with that, let me just do a, a screen share. I'm gonna just give, uh, give the town board, and thanks once again for having us here, but just give you all an update on where we're at and also where we're, we're headed. And uh, Becky Joyce is gonna go over testing and how the testing works and Deanne is going to also be putting on a bit of our chamber hat and talking about the uh, business um, integration with all of this. So hopefully everybody can see the uh, screen share and um, I'll just go through the situation report. This gets updated every day at 4 p.m. Um, I did highlight uh, just, uh, um, I think it's important for people to know, but the first uh, COVID-19 death was recorded in La Plata County over the weekend. Uh, for the state of Colorado, we're at uh, 19,800 cases, 3,600 hospitalized, 60 out of 64 counties um, have uh, recorded COVID-19, 100,000 plus have been tested. Uh, we're at 987 deaths uh, related to COVID or directly um, caused by COVID and 192 outbreaks at residential and non-hospital healthcare facilities. The next one I want to just go over with you all is uh, it's basically uh, showing the cases reported and this is just a graph that basically gives an idea of where we are um, in the uh, really in the pandemic. And we're, we are starting to, I think, go on the, the downward, um, downward curve on this, but um, it's really important to know that this is very ragged or uh, mountaintop type data. So there can be a lot of fluctuations. So that's, you know, we're still kind of on the plateau of, of a summit. So we really need to always keep that into account when we're looking at this information. And we also need to know that it is over the entire state. So we really do look specifically at what's going on in Southwest Colorado. Uh, and this is being done throughout the state um, where uh, we're operating basically in two week planning increments. And that really fits the biology of the virus and uh, where we can see these infections um, appearing. So we, we do all of these so-called community mitigation strategies and we can evaluate how we're doing with these. Uh, the next piece that I wanted to go over is just the criteria um, that we're looking at statewide. This is uh, straight from the governor's office on um, just how, how this information is getting evaluated. We're looking at what level of suppression um, of the virus we've been able to achieve, what is our ability at each moment um, in time for testing and containment. So for uh, San Juan County, we, we implemented testing last week and we have very good uh, strategy with that um, along with case investigation. Um, how can we better protect vulnerable prop populations during each of these phases that we've been operating? Um, I'll just read through these and then um, we'll be addressing each of these during um, tonight's little presentation. This is a big one for us is does our healthcare system have the capacity to help those who are sick, COVID and non-COVID? 
We always have to keep that in account for San Juan County. We do not have a hospital here. We have uh, minimal health care other than our uh, really our two ambulances, our EMS staff, and uh, public health. So we we any person who's very sick, we need to transport out of county and often um, over two county boundaries. So that's really a critical piece. And then <clears throat> uh, what's the level of risk versus societal, economic, and psychological benefit? I think for Silverton, we all can acknowledge that uh, this has been a really challenging time. And uh, our community has been doing just a phenomenal job, but we know also that people are, are really, you know, they are uh, getting at their wits end with it. So we wanna make sure people, we acknowledge that, and we want to make sure people understand that, uh, that we are recognizing that and, and we're taking steps to make sure that we're, we're going in a, a positive direction. Um, and then is this po policy sustainable? I think I just answered that. Um, so those are really the, uh, the big criteria for basically the reopening strategy. And then the next thing I wanna address is that uh, the state has developed an epidemiological model that, that has really guided all of the community mitigation strategies that we've done but the state has now recognized and put resources to doing one for just Southwest Colorado, because they recognized after we, we talked to people at the state that um, Southwest Colorado has a lot of outside external influences, uh, mostly with uh, New Mexico, but also the uh, Navajo reservation, um, Arizona, there's just a lot of movement. So it's really, really important to account for those influences as you're measuring all of these, um, all of these uh, approaches. Um, <clears throat> we're hoping that that gets out, um, that data gets out to us soon, uh, but we are using all this information in our, um, our decisions. Um, the state of Colorado has also extended the disaster declaration um, that uh, gets extended basically on a about a month uh, time frame. Uh, we are also a federally disaster, federally recognized um, uh, disaster. So uh, there's not too many states have that have basically uh, met that criteria, um, and that has opened up. Uh, more resources um, that we do have available to us. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Becky Joyce, who will talk about uh, the testing and um, address a couple of other issues. Thanks, Jim. Hi, everyone. Um, so testing, probably most of you know this just from reading the newspaper, but um, you know, it, you all know it took a really long time to get our diagnostic PCR tests. And all of a sudden we had 20 PCR tests, which are the gold standard for testing. It's the nasal swab. It's really the only test um, with the state of Colorado that is a confirmed positive um, producing test. So this is the gold standard. It's, it's not a finger prick. It's not a blood draw, anything like that. And it's intended to um, be offered when someone is, has symptoms or if it's a healthcare worker or there's just different circumstances of someone thinking they've been exposed. So we finally receive them as well as these really fast ass acting tests as well called Abbott tests that you can know essentially within five to 15 minutes of getting tested whether or not it's positive um, or negative. But we still do both because we're trying to see, you know, the validity of, of the one fast acting Abbott test. So if someone calls and they say, yes, I have symptoms or I have a doctor's order, um, that my doctor believes I may have this, we need to rule it out. We essentially um, tell them where to go and, um, and how, you know, what precautions to take while we're processing the test that goes up to CDPHE. 
we've as a small town, we've met with a lot. <laughs> there was, there's been a lot of um, interesting things that have happened. And, you know, say it goes FedEx in a cooler and the FedEx guy is running late and we don't know if he's coming. So instead one of us run it down to Durango and, you know, all these different little interesting problems and issues, but we're making it happen as best we can. And so we did test a couple people last week and right now, you know, today is Monday, I did not get any calls just for some, from someone saying they were symptomatic. And I didn't last week either. It was kind of two very specific events. Um, and I believe we're advertising it well enough. So that's the PCR gold standard testing. Um, and then there's also the, as you've heard, there's antibody antigen tests, and that's a whole world of its own. The more I learn about it, honestly, the more I start to get even more confused. And so um, essentially Cedar Diagnostics is doing these antibody tests um, down in Durango. You pay $30 and you can get one without a doctor's order. Up here, Silverton Clinic has started to offer them um, as well, but they would like a doctor's order. Um, and so at this point, the Colorado Department of Public Health and Environment, um, who, who I take my guidance from, really isn't endorsing these tests. There's so much to learn. There's many tests out there that aren't FDA approved. Um, when you get the results, they caution that it could be a false positive or a false negative. Um, and so I think just time will tell and there will be more usefulness for these tests in the future. But as of right now, you know, we're just being super cautious about how we interpret those antibody tests. Um, so public health is not offering those. Um, but if someone wanted to pursue one, they can go to Cedar Diagnostics or they can call the Silverton Clinic to get one. So the other thing I wanted to talk about was, um, you know, when there was a cluster of illnesses back in February, I think we all remember them. We don't know whether or not that could have been coronavirus. Towards the end of February, there was quite a few times where I said, man, if I had testing, but our region really didn't even have testing at that time. It was very, very hard. You probably needed to be a resident in Denver and be hospitalized to get that test. Um, so we, we probably will never know if that was the time that the virus spread through our community. So now I'm not having oodles of people come to me or even one or two saying, I've got a fever and a cough. Um, which is really reassuring to me. I'd like to think that, you know, May 13th, and then again, I believe it was the 21st when we really tried to shut down everyone's movements in our own town. Um, perhaps if, there, if something was brewing back in February and early March, you know, I can't help but hope that our efforts, that everyone's efforts, the whole town's efforts really helped either slow or stop something, you know, the speeding train. All I know is that Gunnison was getting pummeled and we were two weeks behind them. And so all the efforts that I think public health did at that time, including the governor's state orders, I believe truly, truly helped. And I would like to say that the whole community um, is better off for it and um, just the fact that we're sitting here right now, um, you know, without a massive outbreak running through our community, um, is it really leaves us in good shape. And so I'll just leave it at that. But hopefully with some more information with the antibody testing and whatnot um, in the future, we might find out, you know, a little more and get more data um, to help us know kind of whether or not we have been exposed um, to the coronavirus more than we realize. So anyways, I also wanna really stress to people that, you know, social distancing, I know it's, it's really hard, it's so hard. Oftentimes it's way easier not to socially distance, but it is working. There's models across the country, across the globe, it works. So our community has been doing a fantastic job with that. Facial coverings, they also work. If you go into an area, into a place where you're gonna be less than six feet from someone, or if you're standing very close to someone, wear a facial covering. 
It's not that hard. And if someone needs a facial covering, we're finding ways through this test site grant to purchase some masks um, for people who have no access to it or who might need it really quickly. You know, some of our returning business owners who are coming back. We want everybody to have, a, have access to this as well. So please contact the public health department if you need a mask. I just ordered 30 more the other day that I'll have available. Um, and we're just taking this as we can go. So, um, and hand washing, all that isn't gonna go away very soon. And the more we all do it, the more we think about us versus myself, you know, I think the smoother we can get through this. And so it's really not about me, it's about us. Um, and I also recognize just the, the tough consequences of social distancing and part of that is being out of work. So what we're hoping by following the governor's safer at home order, um, because San Juan County is doing that, we picked that public health order because it is so comprehensive that we believe it'll allow businesses to open safely. So we have not barred any businesses from being open. Um, we've followed the safer at home order. We've had an advisory out to quarantine because it's just common sense. If you have been living in another community, exposing yourself in another area and you move to a new area, we just ask you take some time to make sure you don't have any, you know, symptomless uh, illness that you may bring here because you know we all don't realize it, but we really cross each other's circles a lot more. This uh, case investigation and doing contact tracing, when you ask a person, who are you around the last two weeks? Because we need to contact every single person you were with. Think about that and then choose who your circle is so that if you were ever to come down with COVID, we could trace because it's really, it's early detection. And now that we have the testing, this is how we're going to hopefully open our businesses safely, have some sort of economy, be able to, to test now, be able to investigate and trace and then contain better. So those diagnostic tools and being able to contain are just so important. Um, it was never our idea to, or it was never our goal to have zero cases, but we just needed tools to be able to test and contain. Um, and then, I think the, the last thing is that I really wanted to stress tonight is please look out for your neighbors, you know, in a way that you can safely and your friends and, and this community, um, reach out to people, check in with them, make sure they're doing okay. This is a really long time for all of us. I know that we're all getting, you know, pretty antsy and um, it's hard, it's really hard and I think about a lot of people here, especially those who might live alone. It's just really important to take that time to reach out to each other and, you know, just to say, hey, I care about you. How are you doing today? Or meet them out in the street and talk to them, you know, from a little distance or what can I get for you? I'm, you know, what do you need? Um, because we all need that and we all need a reminder that it's just social connection is still incredibly important. So I think that's all I have to say for right now. Thank you. Uh, Becky, did you wanna talk a little bit about the symptom tracker and how that helps us out? Thank you. So the state developed an incredible symptom tracker and we, uh, Deanne's done a fantastic job of putting the, um, the link on our website, um, the county websites, um, and if you have had any symptoms January on that you think could be coronavirus-esque, coronavirus which there's a lot of symptoms, um, especially if you were tested for flu and it was negative, we would love to hear about your symptoms, to see your symptoms on the symptom tracker. It just, it asks questions. It, I, it's just a really great way for us to kind of look back and see, you know, what might have happened um, this spring. And um, I think it's pretty easy and it doesn't take very long. And you're also welcome to call our office to talk to us about it. If you have gotten an antibody test and it's negative, we'd love to hear about that too. We do get reported um, all the positive ones. So. Great, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. 
Excellent. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, just more of the reopening strategy. And um, we are still under the, the state public health order, which uh, goes till May 27th. That can always be modified prior to then, and uh, the governor has been talking about that. Um, so I'll go over that timeline just below here. Uh, but I do want to, you know, part of that reopening is we are going to start shifting some of the communications more to the recovery team to have them start addressing some of the longer term economic uh, impact of that. And then when we talk to the um, talk to the group, it'll really be more on the kind of the nuts and bolts of uh, when we get cases in um, in town and how that's being handled. But just so you all know that um, just to start looking out for that. Um, but just some highlights, you know, we really just from last week, we started the reopening um, just today. Town Hall um, has reopened really to uh, allowing visitors to come back in. Construction has been open since last week and um, also some government projects such as the EPA and then also real estate showings. So we're, you know, just slowly turning the the tap on and just making sure that we're just not uh, opening the valve all the way. But just to know that there is progress is happening. Um, let's see. Uh, Deanne, I'm just going to, I'll have you do the, um, the ambassador program just at the end. And I'll talk about these couple of things just since I've got it up on the screen here. Um, but uh, one of the big things is the um, the Durango uh, Silverton Narrow Gauge Railroad did announce that uh, June 8th is when they are going to be uh, basically resuming service. We are working closely with the train and La Plata County since they, they cover two county boundaries um, and ensuring that they can operate and uh, open in a, um, in a safe manner for their customers and also ensure that um, they're really working with both communities in doing it in a um, in a good way, we have to remember it's it's not just the train, but it's also really a lot of tour buses. So those are two kind of transportation pieces that are really um, important to to think about. Um, sometimes the press can uh, relay a little bit of a different message, but I just want you to know that it's there is really good coordination uh, between the train, La Plata County, and San Juan County on that. Um, I'm just, this is straight from the governor's press conference uh, this afternoon, but they are going to um, allow uh, camping to resume in many state parks May 12th. They're going to make a decision about uh, spring skiing for ski areas in Colorado May 25th. And then uh, May 25th is also when they're gonna talk about um, the next steps for restaurants as far as in-service um, dining and summer camps. So just know that things are changing and they really are changing for the better because the data is supporting that. Um, it's very good to see just um, across the state that, um, that places are starting to open up. So we, we just really need to keep that in mind. Um, so now I will turn it over to Deanne, and if Deanne wants to just talk about how we're working with local businesses just to help them get ready for basically the, the new, new reality of, of operating a business um, with COVID-19. Yeah, good evening. Um, so the town of Silverton, Silverton Chamber of Commerce, Office of Emergency Management and the local public health are all partnering with the staff down at the visitor center. So there are business, visitor center staff that are now our ambassadors. So this is a voluntary program for our local business owners that was rolled out last Wednesday on the weekly chamber Zoom meeting. So we have been gathering business owners and local leadership together once a week to discuss the reality of not only what we've been through, where we're at now, and where we're headed as a business community. Um, 
So we've already received a dozen or so um, requests to either A, be completely a part of the ambassador program, which means actually having a, a, a staff member assigned to be boots on the ground to help them set up to be success under the new regulations in order to be in business. Um, and then some have just asked for email information. So we have packets that we send out and then we are gathering resources locally like the hardware store looking for an avenue for you know hand sanitizer hand wipes all the things that these business owners need to be to have to be in compliance now those supply chains are a little difficult we're working towards that i spoke with clem branner today from venture snowboard who has a very thin plexiglass um sheet rolls that he could sell to local businesses to create you know to have a guard in front of their checkout station and then melanie down at hump brothers pizza actually found that basin printing in durango sells signage packages for business owners from the actual signs that go on the floor of your business letting people know about social distancing to all the regulatory signage that you need in your business so she went down and grabbed a bunch today She's actually bringing the sum up for our, the visitor center. This week in the visitor center, we are bringing staff back physically into the building, but not necessarily opening the doors to public. That staff has been assigned to research everything regulation and B to set up the visitor center as a successful model that folks can actually go down and walk through and check out. Um, so we're trying to lead by example again the town of silverton and the silverton chamber just a quick brief for all you new board members have an existing annual partnership in the visitor center and what that means is the town of silverton supplies the building the infrastructure the partnership and then the chamber takes um responsibility for the day-to-day -day management of staff books taxes all that paying the bills, all that kind of stuff. So it takes us about $68,000 a year to run the visitor center, the town budgets for 42, and we make up the difference in book sales. So this month we have um, slimmed down their hours, right? So we're rerouting those hours that were already allocated for staff into funding this ambassador program so that it shows partnership with the town of Silverton Chamber and all the other entities and providing actual tangible services to ensure that our business owners are, are set up for success, you know, to hand just a bunch of handouts and then have 100 people in town deciphering what does that mean to me is really not supporting these guys. So we all banded together, we came, we created this program and we are receiving inquiries in all kinds of forms and we're setting up appointments to actually start going in. So as of May 1st, business owners have had the opportunity to open. No one has necessarily done that step yet because it is difficult and it is consuming to be able to study. And now you need to be an expert, right? And what are all these regulations mean? It was part of the reason why the city of Durango delayed their complete opening until May 8th was because they had to research and find out what do we need to do as a business community, A, and then B, what's happening south of the border was the second part of that decision. But bottom line, we're already receiving success um, in inquiries for our business owners. That also gives us insight as to where people are struggling and where do we put our education towards in the future. But again, it's completely voluntary up to the business owner. Um, it's really exciting to see so many people step up and we really look forward to being a partner with these business owners into making sure that not only do they have a good experience this summer and feel safe in their own business, but also about the guests. You know, this is a tourist economy. We are going to invite folks into our home. Silverton's our home, right? So we want to set them up for success from the moment they hit our city limits. And if we have consistent messaging and mindsets within our community, that only makes the transition of moving around in our community, A, protecting us, the village, B, educating, and C, setting up the business owners to not have to be having that conversation a hundred times a day. So as a retail location and in business, there are certain questions you do have to answer a hundred times a day. So we're just trying to set these guys up for success 
with consistent messaging, positive messaging, but also taking the protection of our community very seriously. Uh, excellent. Thanks, Dean. Um, so with that, really, uh, we're that that's our, our presentation, our report for the uh, town board tonight, and we can answer questions. I think Becky got kicked off the call. So I don't know if Lisa, if you're able to get her back on. Um, but yeah, so we're, we're here to answer questions from the uh, town board and then if time uh, from the community as well. Great, uh, Trustee Barella. Uh, Trustee Barella, you're still muted. I've had a massive problem with my microphone this evening. Um, a good job team, once again. Um, I did have an issue earlier that um, the symptom tractor is um, not allowing anything prior to the date of January 1st of 2020. And so I'm not sure how that can be resolved because um, there are a lot of people that were sick early on that have not been able to get in, myself being one of them. Um, I had a cough for eight weeks that would not go away. It was the worst thing I've ever been through. Um, but that was the end of December. And I know quite a few of my employees as well. So, um, the other thing is, is um, I'm really happy to see that we are all starting to focus now instead of what's been happening on how we're going to move forward and what we can do in order to make this um, something that we can still start making money at, um, enjoy our town, and still keep everybody in here safe. So um, good job, congratulations team. Um, thanks for all the hard work that uh, everybody's been putting in. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Ms. Barella. And I do also want to throw just a big shout out again, just the number of volunteers in the community that have been helping out and especially uh, yourself and uh, Jim Harper with the food bank. Um, you know, it's been just, a, a huge, tremendous community effort. So um, I just want to make sure that's always really acknowledged. Um, with the symptom tracker, I can contact the um, the folks uh, through CDPHE and see about getting um, getting data uh, further back. If Molly, if you want to send me an email with that, I can just try to uh, get that information in there. But thanks for raising that. Okay. Thank you, Jim. I will. Mayor Pro Tem Barney. Thank you, Mayor Furman. Thanks, OEM. You guys are doing a great job. And I appreciate, especially on the testing and tracing, that just seems like a really great step for our community to have access to. And I really appreciate the work that it took you guys to, to bring that here. And I heard Jim mention um, like transferring some of the things, some of transferring certain items perhaps to the recovery team. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what the recovery team is and looks like and does. Uh, sure, um, so the recovery team, we started the recovery team pretty early. They've been meeting once a week. I actually have not even um, on purposely not sat on the recovery team. so. Uh, with that, just know a recovery team's been going on, and then now I'm just going to toss Deanne to it because she is on the recovery team and she can tell you more details. <laughs> yep. So the recovery team um, is chaired by Willie Tukey, county administrator, and then there is um, town of Silverton manager John Ryder, uh, Lisa Branner, town of Silverton, Anthony Edwards, um, Kim White with the school. And that was kind of the initial core team. And now, which was Willie's intention from the beginning is starting to bring in different members of um, groups within like from lodging to restaurant to, um, you know, the train. So uh, Mayor Shane Furman joined last week, um, Andy from Silverton Mountain. And now in the next wave, we're going to roll in um, Jim Harper, as well as uh, Commissioner Fetch, because that's retail. 
Um, Jim has hotel, restaurant, coffee shop. Shane has restaurant lodging. So we're trying to get a diversification of all types of business owners. And then we're working potentially, there's um, hopefully Darlene Watson's gonna be able to join the group. There is some difficultness around schedules that we'll have to address tomorrow. So we're not exactly sure what that's gonna look like, but it's starting to bring in different members and different business sectors of the community as we grow. And so the ultimate vision is truly long-term recovery. And what does that mean? That means socioeconomic, economic, mental well-being, stability of government, all of those factions that go into our community to make us solid and stable. We have every single aspect represented on this, on this um, recovery team. And so we discuss, you know, well, where, where were we? Where are we at? Where are we going? You know, and it's very just direct um, reopening plans. Willie, of course, all of us sit on all kinds of phone calls from DOLA to state to with other county you know, staff there. And so then we all bring back once a week and share information, brainstorm, and actually you're creating a re economic recovery and stabilization plan. Does that answer your question, Sally? Yeah, thank you, Deanne. I appreciate and it. Was, and don't forget about your poem. No, let's, we can save that for another time. All right. <laughs> thank you. I'd like to hear it. Why don't we, we, we will do that, um, but why don't we jump to the community comment unless there are any other trustee or staff questions for the OEM team. Great, so I see one hand raised um, and Lisa, it looks like I have the ability to enable them to talk. Uh, yes, I did share hosting privileges with you so you can enable them. You may want to name them as you unmute them so they know they're up. So Mr. Albert, uh, I don't want to mispronounce your last name, uh, Harich. Um, you are now a panelist. <laughs> Would you tell us how, your name so that we all- You know, think of somebody named Rick and you see him on the street. Hi, Rick. Hi, Rick. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much. Uh, the floor is yours. I'm having some trust issues today with uh, some of the folks that are uh, dealing with my future. And uh, I'm not going to get into it all because it's something I've got to work through. But I'm concerned about who you've reached out to in the lodging community. Uh, Jim said you all have been meeting for a while now. Who have you reached out to in the lodging community? Both let them know what's going on and if they have any advice. Um, I'm since I really don't have a clear picture from anybody, I'm planning on opening on May 27th. Uh, I've got to do something. I'm not getting any guidance. I don't know if it's just uh, you're talking to one or two people in the lodging community or getting their input on your recovery team, which I think is a great idea. I told the town administrator that if, uh, diversity is great. Who are you reaching out to? Your committee meetings are private. You've got action items that you'll bring forward. We'll never know of them, what's going on. And I'm really frustrated. I've been supportive of all of you. I have fought for you guys. You wouldn't believe when people are saying you're communists and the sheriff goose is awful. As of today, I feel a little uh, crapped on. And I need to know, if I can even trust you guys, get us open. Because right now, I just don't, and it's not personal. I'm just not seeing it. And uh, I need better than just promise, oh yeah, we're gonna do this. There's a little glip today, real quick, I know I'm running out of time, that might have mentioned that we're not an essential uh, business because we're a bed and breakfast, whereas they or yours would be. So that little bit made, made me even more untrustworthy right now. A lot of it's cabin fever, but a lot of it's lack of communication. And just not really hearing it from any of you, except Dan. Molly, I appreciate it. And I do have to say one last thing, Shane, or Mayor. I appreciate you reaching out when I had my frustration when we hadn't heard from any of y'all for so long. I thought that was a bold move and I appreciate it. Right now, lacking a little faith this is going to be handled correctly 
I don't mean that personally. I'm looking at it from an economic standpoint and from a trust standpoint. And my three minutes are up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hyrick. Uh, so just a reminder, we will continue our policy of the trustees not engaging during these comment periods. However, since this was specifically uh, created in order for questions to be asked to the OEM team, uh, if the OEM team would like to respond to Mr. Hyrick's comments, we, we will permit that tonight. Uh, certainly, and Albert, I, uh, I very much appreciate you asking that, and I'm sure everyone in the business community and just in the community in general just has a lot of fear and uncertainty going ahead with this. All I can say is that we have um, the OEM team, uh, public health, that we have attended every town uh, board meeting uh, since this incident was declared a disaster and every uh, county commissioner's meeting. Uh, with that being said, um, communication is always a challenge. Um, I do know that you know we've been talking with the uh, Chamber of Commerce on a regular basis and uh, Deanne has all the numbers on the numbers of emails that we've sent out, the number of, of newspaper articles that we've sent out. Um, you know, but I do want to make sure that you do feel comfortable that we are working to um, to get things open. Um, you know, all I can say is that we have gotten uh, businesses open. There are businesses that never actually closed. We understand there were economic reasons some businesses decided to stop operating, but um, it is really important to uh, to note that. And as far as lodging, um, you know, we can talk on more specifics because there are details in the state public health order that, uh, that basically divvied lodging up and it does get a bit complicated. I can speak from personal experience because I did have a vacation rental and I had to, to cancel all of the uh, vacation uh, rentals that I had um, lined up in the spring. So I, I physically stopped my own personal economic interests. I know that's not going to help at all. I, I just know that I just want you to know that I very much sympathize and we are just working towards um, getting things uh, back going. And Deanne, would you like to jump in from the chamber's perspective on this? Absolutely. You know, first, I, you know, just state that, you know, that's why we are having the weekly chamber zooms is so that business owners do have that unified message, because then I take that back to the group. But one thing I've learned now being through about four disasters is that, you know, you do start with a core group that is just the structure of management. And so right, you create a core group, and then you grow it. And then you expand to there and then you go to the public. So you really do have to create a solid base. So yes, does it, is it perceived to you that, you know, these are in private, you know, these are, you know, whatever complicated conversations that we're not having with the general public. Actually, that's what the canvas of the chamber calls are on. And, and you know, Albert, I, I even deferred to you during that lodging um, discussion because you were one of the guys that I trusted would actually have the best practices. But that's just the structure and management of situation. And then you start to broaden the horizon going from there, like coming to these town board meetings where the public does get the information, the same with the trustees and has that two-way conversation. And then secondly, I'd like to say, you know, this is Silverton and it's a small little town and we're all humans and you can always make a phone call. You can, you know, it, communication is a two-way street. And so we do put a lot of information out there and, you know, we have really busy days and we get in the weeds, but you know, everyone in this community and in case, including your trustees are all people who live here and you can reach out and have civil conversations and go straight to the source. And, you know, lastly, I would challenge this community to, you know, this is very distressing times and social media, is an amazing forum for communication, but as equally, it can be detrimental to people, you know? So it's, if you are feeling stressed or you're 
you need a timeout. One of the first things I encourage people to do is take a break from social media, right? Yes, the information immediate and on the fly, but it's not always correct. And it's not always positive. And so I'm a human too. And I have to step away sometimes. And I know you guys are sitting there waiting for the answer. And oh my God, what is it? And I have challenged many people this week, like, hey, why don't you give me a call? Like, let's just talk on the phone. Or like you said, when Mayor Furman went and, you know, had a phone call conversation with you. So I just want to remind this little village that we're all people. We're all functioning dysfunction at times. And everyone is one phone call or email away. And I've put my cell phone out there a lot. But for us to kick dirt and just start agitation, that's something I am challenging this community to not participate in. And, and I am just going to be straight up about that. But to be respectful, have positive conversations amongst each other, and ask very poignant questions, um, everyone is here available for that. Thank you. Thank you. And we have two more public comment requests. Uh, we're going to Ms. Wendy Polly. Yes, thank you, Shane. So first, I, I'd like to echo Albert's response, both in terms of the support that's been given and the frustration at the communication right now. The, um, you know, to say somebody's kicking up dirt because we want answers, I think is inappropriate at this point. And I think I'll be very specific. The lodging communication has been zero. And if you think that it's too complicated for us to understand, I don't think that's for you to judge. I think you need to give us the information and let us get our businesses open. And then my second point is, it's a shock to us tonight to hear that this ambassador program is available to start because just a few days ago it was said it's coming, but there was nothing to say we can start right now. So maybe that's why you haven't had anybody take you up on it. That communication was not clear. So again, I'll echo the support Appreciate the communication, appreciate what y'all are doing, but we're through hearing what a rah-rah session this is about a village. And we have business owners that want to get open and are concerned and want to get answers on their specific businesses and what we need to do. And that's my comment. Mr. Fer you. Mayor Furman, may I answer that? Um, uh, sure. Villa Dalla is actually signed up, Wendy. Um, your mother today emailed and asked for the information and um, an appointment. So I apologize if you weren't in that loop, um, but just to let you know, Villa Dahlia is actually um, already in the hopper for an ambassador. Uh, thank you. We're now moving to Mr. Paul Zimmerman. Mr. Zimmerman, you have the floor. You'll just need to unmute yourself. There we go. All right. Everybody hear me now. Paul Zimmerman here. Loud and Thank clear. you, Shane. Um, you know, the comments I'd like to make is obviously, and a bunch of you on the screen there helped support us. We tried to stay open as long as we could. Um, now that we're at the safer at home, uh, we probably could make a go of it, but we need to be allowing some people to pass into town. Um, I'm not sure. I mean, on the safer at home, what I understand from the uh, governor was uh 10 mile limit but that was for recreation there's people on the roads they may need a restroom they may need whatever um you know if they stop in the grocery store if they were to come to me to get food to go i don't understand why we're pushing everybody out we have to slowly start to deal with all this and open up um, our goal at this point is to open for memorial day weekend Hopefully we are allowing people to pass through town without it. As much as we love everybody in town, as everybody knows, there's not enough people to support the businesses built. I mean, 10,000 people a day in the summer and you've got all these businesses going, we can do that. Um, you know, a few hundred people, which is great. We'd see probably half every week, but it's still not enough to maintain your business and your bills and order more food to continue going. 
Um, anyway, so that's some of what I'd like to see. I'd also like to see, as probably Wendy and Albert said, let's get some hard dates. Let's really plan this out so that we can give that to people wanting to visit Silverton. And so they know what's going on. We don't need them getting here, getting yelled at or whatever. I mean, let's, let's get some hard plans in place. And I guess uh, that's what I wanted to say. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you guys. Uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Paul, I really appreciate you uh, asking that. Um, I'll answer part of it, but then I'll ask Sheriff Conrad to answer the more of the opening piece. And just Paul, so you know, we are, uh, we are operating in these basically two week increments as data gets evaluated and then we're making these decisions. But just know that that, that uh, state public health order of May 27th is really the, that's when there will be a significant change. And um, you know, that, that's by far the, uh, the strongest date. And I did show the screen earlier. Um, we can always distribute this. It was straight from the governor's press conference, but they are looking at evaluating May 25th as a potential opening uh, for in-service uh, for restaurants. We just need to always couch all of these dates with how the, basically how the data uh, plays out. So that's always just very important. And I also recognize the uncertainty is absolute, you know, drives a business person crazy because, um, you know, it's just very difficult to plan. But with that, I'll let uh, Sheriff Conrad address just our, our next strategy with uh, basically kind of um, uh, opening um, opening up uh, Silverton a little more. Thanks. Uh, hopefully, Bruce, are you on there? Hopefully you can unmute yourself. Sheriff Conrad, you are unmuted, but we can't hear you. Um, I think that while he works on that, we will go to Mr. Blake Campbell. Uh, Mr. Campbell, you have the floor. All right, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, our family owns some property in South County, hope to be a future business owner. Uh, thank you for the communications that you guys have been giving, been following on Facebook. Subscribe to the YouTube channel so I get notifications when these meetings come up. Um, I appreciate the work you guys have been doing. Thank you. Um, Deanne has been working also 25 hours a day, eight days a week. It's been crazy. <laughs> and I know she's, she's working hard. And you guys, the other guys, I don't know specifically, but I'm sure you are. Thanks for everything you do. Um, I have one specific question, but before that, um, I suggest having voluntary openings when, you know, that's appropriate when you guys can do that. And my main question is, I missed the first part of the meeting. Did we talk about the train? That was one of my questions. If there's been uh, updates on what's happening with the train, that's all for me. Uh, certainly, uh, thank you, uh, Blake, for that question. And we did address uh, the train. Um, we are working closely with the train. They are a private business. And currently they have decided uh, June 8th is what they're uh, shooting for. Just know that that date could change based on information, but that is what uh, they are um, they are currently uh, putting out there at the moment. Uh, Deanne, did you want to give anything further on that? On the train? Yeah. So at this point in time, the communication that we do have from the train is that they pushed their start date to June 8th. But what that looks like is still to be determined. So the train is actually going to join us Wednesday um, on the chamber Zoom call, which is for, for business owners. It is for licensed business holders, chamber or non-chamber members. Um, but Esper has been attending those meetings and reporting it on it. So we'll hear, hear directly from them on Wednesday. Thank you. And Sheriff Conrad, were you able to work out your microphone? It appears perhaps not. I'll I'll just address uh, uh, basically. I you know I think um, Paul was 
probably quite concerned just about the kind of checkpoint style um, entrance to town and just know that that, though that is going to be relaxing. We're going to maintain the, um, the sign that we have requested from CDOT to stay there, but we're going to change that messaging um, to basically more of like a suggestion such as uh, wear a mask in town, uh, something like that. But as far as uh, cones and um, more of that checkpoint look, that is really going to reduce. So, um, you know, there, there will be a lot more traffic flow into town um, moving, moving forward. OEM team, thank you very much. Um, I hope that everyone attending this meeting uh, valued this update and also the ability to comment. And with that, we will move on to our next agenda item. And I'd like to ask Mayor Pro Tem Barney if she would like to share the poem. Thank you, Mayor Furman. I will, it's quick. Um, a dear friend and mentor shared it with me and I just felt like it was a really good way to frame some of our thinking in such uncertain times when there is a lot of fear and um, uh, decision-making that has to happen or lack of decision-making such as it is. So I can't share my screen, which, <laughs> which means I'll read it to you. Okay, this is uh, by Nelson Mandela. Oh, maybe I can. This is my prayer for you today, that your career decisions, your voting decisions, your financial decisions, your leadership decisions, your parenting decisions, that the driving force behind what you do say and think would be influenced by hope and optimism rather than fear and negativity. And that in doing so, we can start to create a world that we want instead of a running away from things that we don't want. We can move towards something larger and more magnificent instead of making everything smaller and easier to control. We can wake up with a smile on our face instead of a sense of dread in our gut. We can impact the next generation, helping them to understand that there is something to live for, not escape from. So today and every day, may your choices reflect your hopes, not your fears. Thank you very much, Mayor Proton Barney. Thanks for the time. Well, that was quite nice. Um, we move on now to approval of our consent agenda, which includes payroll accounts payable and the meeting minutes from the April 20th work session, as well as the April 27th meeting um, and a ratification of an action that I took earlier this week to approve a flyover that was requested by uh, Mr. Ray Dilio on behalf of the, um, I'm blanking now, on behalf of the, one sec. American Legion? Yes, thank you. On behalf yeah. of the American Legion uh, for Memorial Day. Um, and the reason that this is in here is that I was not aware of the specific process and what I can and cannot approve on behalf of the town. And I thought it would be good to start a best practice of any type of thing requiring my signature, uh, either coming in front of the board uh, before or ratified shortly after. And in this case, I did call administrator Ryder before I signed this approval uh, to ask what the process was and request his permission before uh, signing on behalf of the town. Does anyone have comments or adjustments or questions to any of the consent agenda items? Trustee Barella. Um, as to this being an action uh, for the flyover for Memorial Day, um, this is something that the uh, American Legion has put together since uh, approximately 1952 in Silverton, um, as far as being a Memorial Day celebration they go up and they put flags on all the graves of everybody buried in the Hillside Cemetery. And um, when Ray came to town, he brought in the ability to have a flyover. So this has been going on for a considerable amount of time. 
And uh, this should be something that is, doesn't matter who's in the position of mayor. This is something that we should always hold in a deep respect and always give um, credit to those who it's due to. So uh, my father being one of the American Legion members for probably the last, oh, since 1976. So quite a few years. Thank you, Trustee Barilla. I completely agree. And that's why I felt comfortable signing this. The reason that I mentioned the process is that there may be other actions asked of me or other trustees um, that maybe aren't as easily supported by everybody where um, a process is good to have. But yes, 100% agree that I, I saw this as being wholeheartedly supported by this board and had no trepidation in signing it. I did have two notes on our uh, consent agenda items. One is the work session minutes in who's present. The words pro tem are missing in front of uh, Sally's name. It says Mayor Shane Furman and Mayor Sally Barney on page seven. So noted. And I believe that was my only note. Did anyone else have any questions about payables or other things like that? Great, so then I would like a, to ask for someone to make a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. As amended, my apologies. I'll second. Roll call Who please. Who seconded? Trustee Lashley. Trustee Barella? Yes. Trustee Harper? Yes. Trustee Wagert? Yes. Trustee Birma? Yes. Trustee Lashley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Barney? Yes. Mayor Furman? Yes. Moving on now to staff reports. Any updates from staff or administrator writer or any questions with respect to the substance of the staff reports from any of the trustees? I would like to say thank you to Mayor Pro Tem Barney for uh, providing some suggestions on how to make these uh, staff reports may be a little more meaningful and easier to review. So we'll be incorporating that uh, for our next meeting. I think it was an, it's gonna be an attempt to really get these staff reports focused on issues that the board you know, will be interested in versus kind of running, here's what we do every day kind of stuff. We've been attempting to do that, but I appreciate her input and uh, we'll do our best to implement that. Thank you, Mr. We could also go through a couple of revisions first if staff wanted to do that. No pressure on time there. Okay, it's actually been something we've been meaning to do and this will, while it's a topic, we'll, we'll try to get to it. Trustee Barilla. Um, this one is for Mr. Ryder in reference to attended San Juan Development Association board meeting. Um, what actually was the result of that? What came out of that meeting with San Juan Development? You know, this one was mainly focused on uh, reinvigorating the Opportunity Zone perspectives process. It had been started by Mel Russick. We have a very, 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 very rough draft. Uh, so the focus is mainly how do we, how do we uh, resurrect that project and get that prospectus in a form that we that we uh, that we like and, and get it out there. It just kind of stalled with Mel leaving the group, and uh, that was the main focus. We also talked about resetting San Juan Development Association's overall business goals. It had kind of slid away from true business economic development, and you know it was mainly crisis management because of all the things you know, that have happened in the last few years. And uh, uh, so there's a little bit of talk about starting to, starting to prep San Juan development for the next phase here and get back to economic development as its primary goal. Okay. One more. Steve yeah, please. Um, attended the EMS board meeting, the first one as a new board member. Um, so what role did you actually take on 
in there because wasn't the former mayor also, I don't remember what she was. Wasn't she the bookkeeper or something? Yeah, she was, yeah, she was kind of the bookkeeper and uh, secretary. Um, somehow I managed to get out of any really official additional role, but I, I, I am going to help fetch eventually with the, uh, being the treasurer uh, and possibly secretary, but we, I asked and they accepted that I have a little bandwidth problem right now. So I didn't want to get too involved in, you know, taking on a specific role like treasurer at this time, but I will probably gravitate that to that over time. So does that mean we can actually expect our quarterly reports? <laughs> yes, you can. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Any other questions or uh, feedback on the trustee reports? Trustee Weger. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Ryder, I'm just curious if you could speak to us a little bit briefly about uh, the town's plan as far as moving forward with the Mullis Lake Campground. Uh, I'm sure we can recognize that that's a popular destination for visitors and having heard today that Colorado Parks is uh, now going to allow openings of campgrounds if we're going to move forward with that and where we're at with somebody who could run the uh the fee management what was the last part trustee Weigert? the well we had a contract with um with somebody to uh, you know run the place yeah, yeah. so we do where have, we're at there we do have a contract with brian fulmer and his wife uh they've actively been managing the reservations to date which have been strong uh <laughs> we todd bove has put a plan together that he's been working with with Kimmet and Jim Donovan and a little bit of Becky just to see if this operational plan, you know, would would marry up well with the public state or the public health orders. We had been told up until yesterday that state campgrounds were closed indefinitely. And so Todd's been putting a plan together that he can get the campground open seven to 14 days subsequent to the state opening up. Well, it looks like the state may open up tomorrow. Uh, so we'll be following closely. We'll probably do some revisions to our plan. One of the big concerns is public restrooms and how do we clean them safely. And we've been trying to find guidance on that. Uh, and probably the most important hurdle is can we get the uh, personal protection equipment in volume enough that we can do that cleaning and keep the workers safe. So there's still a few things to work out, but Todd's been on it knowing that it was any day that the state was going to open back up and that we'd lag behind them maybe one or two weeks while we get prepared. So we'll talk to Todd tomorrow. I just texted him when I saw Jim Donovan's uh, presentation that the state looks like they may open up tomorrow. That's so, great to hear. Uh, it's a we, we had larger. thought about, sorry, we thought about canceling June just because of where we were at. So we were almost getting ready to uh, contact reservationists and cancel and allow them to reschedule. We did not do that today. So timing was everything. That's great to hear. Uh, I'm happy to see that it's going to be open. It's a great amenity for visitors coming here and a good way to bring some revenue into the town coffers. Yep. Reservations, you know, pre pre COVID were really strong in January and February. Wonderful, thank you. Any other questions or moving on to trustee reports? Great, moving on to trustee reports. Uh, trustee Birma, do you have any updates or reports from the past two weeks? I do not at this time, no. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem Barney, do you have any updates or reports? And I'm just going in the order that everyone's on my screen. There's no, uh, there's, there's nothing else about the order that I'm calling. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a Kendall Mountain update and I'm just going to switch screens here real quick. So we met this, we met last week to review 11 applications um, and for a selection of two members that will, who will replace Shane and Austin on that committee. I remain as the chair as a town trustee and the committee selected Anthony Edwards and Jeff Davis to represent the 
community members on that committee. And then um, I also am on the Parks and Rec Committee and that began this week just with a series of emails and phone calls to try and schedule our first meeting. And the purpose of that meeting will be to just kind of get our bearings and figure out what that committee, um, hear from Todd and, and Lisa and get an update on kind of what they already have going and where they need support and what the background is. Thank you, Mayor Proton Barney. <clears throat> Trustee Lashley, any updates? No, no uh, Mayor Furman, I think Sally covered the Kendall Rec um, think topics that we discussed. Great, thank you. Trustee Barella? Um, yes, we had a library board meeting of which Mr. Ryder attended along with, uh, with me. And the discussion was how to open a library, what best practices are for a library, considering um, the fact that the state has listed all libraries in with regular like retail businesses. So trying to figure out how that's gonna work, the dynamic, um, Jackie has been in touch with the uh, State Library Board and what their recommendations are to how to move forward. And so um, computer would be by appointment and you'd have to make that, um, you'd have to come in with a mask. You'd have to, I believe we were gonna go with wear gloves. So that way the um, computer um, keyboard could be wiped down, sterilized, and then the next person that came in would not have to worry about it on a very limited basis. And she'll continue with uh, delivery and curbside. And it's been a tremendous amount of volume going through the library, even though it's closed. So we have to give kudos to Jackie for really keeping our community um, in the know, whatever they wanted. Um, the only thing that we are not allowed to do is interlibrary exchange for additional um, books or tombs that we don't carry in town um, because the courier is not operating at the moment. Um, did I miss anything, Mr. Ryder? No, I think you got it. I, did you mention it's gonna be two days a week, You know, this kind of limited opening and depending on the volume, she would expand to three or more days a week just as yeah, just as, as the need shows. So, um, but thank goodness that we still have this wonderful asset and um, Jackie was willing to do whatever the community needed to go forward, so. I mean, if you get a chance to thank Jackie, she was literally making house calls to exchange books and get movies to people while they were, while we're kind of locked down. Thank you, Trustee Brella. Trustee Weger, any updates? I've got no committee meetings that I attended or anything like that, but I uh, just have an observation out here, you know, before we had this last bit of rain here today, it's been about three weeks since we had any precipitation. We are forecasted to go into a major drought. I think it's important that we start considering our water security plan and prioritizing that, I feel like that's going to be very important here in the upcoming future. Forecasts are for uh, droughts, mega droughts for southwestern United States, and water security is something that I believe is very important. And we have quite tremendous resources up here, but uh, pretty weak water rights. We could actually uh, lose lose our water rights for the town if there's a call further on down Valley. So uh, something that the trustees need to be aware of and something that we should be prioritizing in my opinion and uh, looking into and moving forward with. Thank you, Trustee Wiegert. Uh, Trustee Brella. Um, good point that Jess brought up. Um, how are we with the attorney that was moving those water rights um, and looking at them for us? Was that, what was her name, Trout, Troutner? Oh my goodness, I can't think of her name for the life of me. To also quickly interject for the public's benefit, uh, all of the trustees received copies of the, the plan that Trustee Wiegert referred to uh, 
in terms of water from Mr. Seitz this week. And we're reviewing that and a question for administrator writers, will we receive some type of presentation about those plans at some point in the relative near future? Yes. Yes, John Seitz asked that I specifically uh, report on that, that he is preparing a presentation, you know, in summary for the board that will happen shortly. Wonderful. And just to clarify, that's the water security plan. Uh, there are Trustee a number Morelli. of plans in there, but water security would definitely be one of them. Cool. I never received the email. It must be stuck someplace. They it was were actually very... put on a thumb drive, Trustee Barella, that's here available at time. I can ask Kelly. Yeah, she's nodding her head. So there's there's one here at town hall for you. Okay, but I, I don't, I'm going through every email. I don't even see an email to come and get it. Maybe I do. No, I'm already back to 423. Okay, that's neither here nor there. Thank you. Trustee Harper, any updates? Uh, no, sir, not at this time. Thank you. Uh, to just close it out, I have a couple of updates. I went, I attended a uh, Colorado Association of Ski Town meeting on Friday, uh, which is known as CAST, that Silverton's participated in for quite some time. And there was a roundtable discussion among mayors. There were about 16 mayors in attendance over the course of the meeting, uh, in, including many of our neighbors. And it was very interesting to hear how each of the communities have been affected by COVID and all of the extenuating circumstances as a result and what they're doing to uh, prepare their communities to recover. Um, and the big takeaway that I had was that we're pretty fortunate in Silverton. We have a huge amount of capable people relative to our population. And as bad as it seems here, I can assure you that it's much worse than a lot of our uh, neighboring communities. As an example, any community where Vail Resorts is, uh, the, operation, the operational partner for the ski area, uh, Vail is talking about not having any operations for the summer and just looking to next winter, which is going to cripple all of those towns. Um, and so we don't, we don't currently have that same dynamic, which I find to be quite nice. Um, I did have an update with the, about the substance of that meeting with uh, Lisa Branner and Administrator Ryder earlier today. And if anyone wants to chat more about that with me and hear about what other towns are doing, I am hosting office hours every Wednesday from noon to two. And there's a link to schedule those office hours on the town's Facebook page, as well as my own website and Facebook page. And I'd actually urge any one of the trustees also to uh, consider hosting office hours, uh, maybe only once a month, there's no need to commit to every week. But uh, that was a good takeaway from what other communities are doing. A bunch of the trustees, especially during these periods are engaging more with the public to give them uh, increased opportunities to speak with us. Um, I also attended the recovery team meeting, which the OEM team went over. And those are my three updates. Uh, one last note about committees would be that I would, I would love to urge everyone to attempt to schedule their first committee meeting between now and the next town meeting to appoint a chair, uh, receive an update from the staff on that committee in terms of what their priorities are and create the description of the scope of that committee, which I know we all felt a little um, uncertain about when we had this conversation last. And I think that's a, a great work session with staff to help determine the scope of each committee and then report back at our next meeting if possible. With that, we have an item on our agenda called continued business. Administrator Ryder, anything there? Nothing there. Great. Um, so we move on to new business. So the first part of new business is a discussion of town's communication policies, which is gonna be a presentation by Lisa Branner. Good evening, trustees. Thank you, Mayor Furman. Um, I am going to endeavor to share my screen with you. Hopefully you can all see that.
And so um, by the request of the mayor, and also I think John Ryder and I were kind of on this same page that we wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on communications wise, especially in the midst of um, COVID-19 and our uh, response to that. Talk a little bit about what the town is doing as far as communication. So tonight we're going to talk about just an overview of what's going on with external communications, um, work that's in progress in the community relations department, and then also some policy considerations and recommendations for you all. Um, and so what is external communication? Basically, this is how the town relays information to its constituents and its stakeholders. Um, and we are using a variety of different methods to reach these audiences. Um, right here, you're going to see just an outline of all of the different methods that we use to reach out to the public. Um, we have three different websites. We have a number of different domain names that point people to one of these websites. For example, something like silvertonweddings.com is used in advertising so that we don't have to give people a really big clunky, non-memorable website address. Um, and it'll direct them to the facility rental page on the town website. Um, for print media, we are doing currently two different newspaper columns. Town Talks, you're probably more familiar with. That's been ongoing for at least the last year where different town staff write a column on a variety of different topics. The Kendall uh, Committee has recently started the Kendall Community Connection. Um, and that is just intended to build public awareness of the Kendall project and the work that's being done there. We do periodically put out press releases, advertising and announcements. Um, we have two Instagram accounts, five Facebook pages. Uh, you can see here the different number of followers that we have on all those various pages. We have recently upgraded our YouTube channel and started uh, live streaming video to it. So all of these trustee meetings are showing up live on the YouTube channel. And then also um, they live there permanently. I have organized some playlists to make it easy for people to find what they're looking for. Kendall also has a YouTube channel um, and we have a service called the Open Media Project that we are using as well um, that indexes our board meetings by agenda. So people can click on a link and get taken to that specific point in the video. Other forms of external communication, obviously Zoom has come to the forefront recently. Uh, we've got email, phones, we're using Nixle for emergency um, communication. There are a variety of different meetings that we do. We've done a bunch of surveys in the past. Um, so all of these various methods are what we're using to reach the public. Work in progress. You may have noticed in my staff reports um, mention of the town website migration. We have a soft launch coming up next week. The immediate priorities with this are to clean up the navigation menu so it's very clear and people have an easier time finding the information they're looking for, um, including staff contact information. I think it's a little bit buried right now. We're working on cloud access to public documents. So there will be a SharePoint um, site that lives in the cloud that all of our meeting agendas, meeting minutes, any information that the public may want to access resolutions, ordinances, that sort of information will be available for them to access and download. And then we're also working on getting Google Analytics on the back end of the website. We currently don't have any way to track what people are looking at to even know um, which pages on our website get, them, get the most hits and the things that we should prioritize. So working on that, um, and then there will be ongoing longer term revisions going on as well right now. What's happening is that our website provider is upgrading to a different platform or a newer version of the Drupal platform, Drupal 8. Um, and so it's a mandatory migration and we did get a little bit of an extension because of COVID. It's been a challenge to get it done with all the other um, communication stuff going on, but we are on track for that migration to happen next week. 
Um, other work in progress with the trustee meetings and work sessions. I continue to refine the way the Zoom platform is working for us. You can see tonight that Mayor Furman is taking the lead on some of the things I'm hoping eventually um, that other staff and the mayor will be able to do a lot of running the meeting on their own. Um, when we go back to having in-person meetings, uh, I have a plan that I'm working on for getting live streaming to continue at that point in time. And um, as I mentioned before, the packet delivery process, we'll have that uploaded to the website and uh, we're working on getting an email marketing platform going that folks would be emailed with a link and they could just go download the information um, on their own. Branding, another thing that's kind of on the forefront, just getting a consistent look and feel to all of our communications. We've been working on streamlining the phone tree um, and then I've been doing quite a bit of work on the recovery team and assisting as deputy PIO. So um, I'm going to pause there and just see if there are any questions. Okay, so moving on. Um, I wanted to talk as well tonight a little bit about what the current policies um, that the town has in place for communications are. And in reality, we have no formalized external communi communication policy. Um, the staff has a sort of informal loose policy that we follow, um, but I really think this is something that the trustees should look at and uh, we really should have a formalized policy going forward. So for email, uh, we all know that we need to be using uh, our town email addresses and that any communication that goes through those is subject to records requests with PR and media requests. Uh, myself and administrator Ryder serve as the primary contacts there and uh, staff are typically running any written submissions to the paper be by me before they submit them. And then we do have some social media policies in place. Um, Basically, I am maintaining administrative control of the various Facebook pages. Staff can contribute content. Um, we have Kendall, Mullis, and the events Facebook pages that are working more in a marketing capacity. On those platforms, we do often respond to messages or questions. Uh, then we also have the town Facebook page, which is being used for official communication only. It's one way, it's dissemination of information. Um, and there really isn't any exchange happening on that page. Typically we'll post first to the official town page and then we share it to other pages to make sure it's, it's being distributed widely in the community as appropriate. Um, typically uh, staff and trustees are encouraged not to engage in discussion of town issues via the web or via social media and we are not viewing it as an appropriate channel for dialogue or public comment. So that is what's currently in place with um, policies. And like I said, these are loose policies. There is no formal set policy. This is what the staff has been working with though. Moving along, uh, public comment policy for the community. Um, appropriate channels of communication for the public currently we're looking at anything in writing, so email, written letters. Uh, there is a comment form on the town's website, albeit somewhat buried, and I'm working on making that more visible and available to people with the migration. And then also responses to any town issued surveys and polls. Folks have participated in a number of different community visioning meetings and been able to have their voices heard there and, and that uh, incorporated into planning processes. Um, and then also speaking during public comment uh, in our trustees meetings. Informal communication, so face-to-face -face or telephone is typically not actionable in the same way that something submitted in writing is. And I think it's important for the community to understand that. And again, these are not necessarily uh, formal policies um, aside from the public comment during trustee meetings. I think that's the only formalized policy that we actually have. So recommendations, um, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's important that we look at formalizing some internal and external communication policies. 
Some of the things we may look at there are the roles and responsibilities of the communications department, as well as other staff and trustees. Um, the purpose of these various communication platforms and how we would like to use them. A social media policy, a formalized one, I think will be very important going forward, as well as media relations, internal communications between staff, staff and trustees, trustees and trustees, and then also the way that we engage with the public. And lastly, um, given where we're at right now, emergency communication policy. Um, I think it's become clear, you know, through COVID that we have some gaps here and there, there's some work to be done on tightening that up. So um, that is the gist of it. Um, and I'm happy to entertain any questions or discussion from trustees at this point. Trustee Varela. Um, great work, Lisa, thank you. That's been a long time coming. Um, I know at several of our retreats, we talked about these processes and, and what they were and what they entailed and what they needed to be going forward. And you pretty much summed up everything that we kind of touched on before. Um, I'm glad to see it's finally in a written form so we can potentially move forward and actually adopt this um, as a formal, item to make sure that we all understand what platforms and where we have to be. Thank you. My pleasure. I mean, I'd like to reiterate too, I, I definitely want trustee feedback on this. I would love to see potentially a committee form to work on the nuts and bolts and getting into the nitty gritty details of some of this. So. Thank you. I think one of the things that is uh, probably more part of the the policy specifics, but I would like to create is whatever our our policy should be in terms of a reasonable expectation by the public of a response to uh, issues raised, emails submitted, or public comment during meetings. Right now, I think there's a feeling of helplessness sometimes where you know we can't respond based on these policies live, which I think is probably a good idea. But it would be nice if there was a, a some type of formal indication of when we would respond to the issues raised. Trustee Barella. And that's one thing that we've had a problem with before when we get a gigantic group e email, either from a um, constituent or um, other board members. I'm pretty sure as other board members, we all know not to respond. Um, but when the public does it and they do it as a large group email to all of us, it's very hard to say, well, maybe I should respond. Maybe you should respond. So knowing the, I don't know, the sequence of responses, I guess, when we get those big ones, um, just how we vet that, who, who should respond, when they should respond. Because we had one gal probably for prior to any of you, well, a few of you getting on, um, we had one gal probably emailing us every single week about an issue she wanted a response on. And, <laughs> and I don't think anybody ever responded because we didn't actually know what the best practice was for that, so. So would this, uh, would this group support the next meeting having a, a proposed additional committee or do we think this is death by committees at this point? Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Barney. It may be death by committee, but I'm totally into the committees and I like it because it's where work gets done. And I think every single one of us on candidates night expressed the desire to be good listeners. And we know that that's what makes a good trustee. So if we can work on, I've felt a little confused as a trustee about like what to respond to, how, how to listen, especially right now with so much social distancing happening. I just feel like I don't even see people. So, um, and I, I mean, like I said in the last meeting, I, I'm, I'm happy to hop on a committee like this, especially if it's kind of like we work on something for the next couple months and then then it should be done. It doesn't seem like it needs to go on in perpetuity. Trustee Birma. I was just gonna add that it would be nice to see it as we migrate things to the new website, see it posted by the trustees and mayor contacts and 
you know, especially as we formalize what that means and the best means of communication, just so that it's a good reminder for us and the public. Thank you both. Great. Well, I suppose the best thing to do will be to uh, evaluate the feedback from each of the committees at the next meeting to see what the big action items are and priorities are so we can understand which committees are moving quickly and have a lot of responsibilities for the trustees and which ones are less of a time commitment so that we can figure out who has time to allocate to a communications policy committee. Trustee Barella. Um, I'm curious if that should go under, um, what's the name of that one, uh, personnel and code, because that's kind of what it's encompassing, isn't it? Right. So, so my take on that from speaking with administrator Ryder is that that would make sense, except that the code committee is going to be extremely busy uh, coming up. Um, currently, staff meets once a week to talk about code revisions and updates, and they're tackling those revisions in a, a priority list that uh, Planner Adair and uh, Building Inspector McDougall and Administrator Ryder are deciding upon. And I believe we'll talk about this offline to figure out specific scheduling, but the idea is to start incorporating the code committee trustee members every other week in those meetings to participate and receive updates. But um, since that is something that's moving pretty quickly and efficiently with staff. Uh, we didn't want the trustee participation to hinder anything. And so that was something we were gonna wait for indication from Administrator Ryder on how he thought that best was handled as well as Planner Adair. Um, but my concern again would be if that's meeting every other week and substantive, um, that perhaps the communications policy committee should be a standalone, but happy to hear thoughts on that. I voiced mine. I think it should be part of the other one because I, I don't mind meeting, but you know, make it part of something else that already exists, in my opinion. Trustee Harper. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I just want to better understand. Um, I understand the communication policies with staff, but with regards to elected individuals. Um, shouldn't there be that transparency? Shouldn't there be that availability to communicate with the public? Lisa, would you or, like to respond to that? I think it's a matter of the forum that the communication is happening in and that what we have seen largely happen in social media is it becomes a downward spiral very often um, into negativity versus an actual um, beneficial dialogue. So, you know, I think we are looking at ways to engage the community, uh, whether it be the newspaper column, or I love the fact that Mayor Furman is starting to host office hours. Other communities do uh, coffee with their trustees, you know, a couple times a month or something like that and mix it up as far as who attends. Um, obviously, that's not tenable right now, given that we're all social distancing. But um, there are a lot of different ways that we can look at engaging the community that I think would be more beneficial than um, utilizing social media, for example, for that purpose. I think there are other ways to do it. So yes, I think transparency and communication between trustees and the public is important. Um, I think we need to just figure out what the ideal ways to do that are. Isn't social media today's newspaper? Uh, yes, yes it is. And we have a town uh, Facebook page where we broadcast the type of information you would get in the newspaper. I, I just, I understand if, if staff doesn't want to communicate, but you know, if someone wants to call me out, call me out. I'll be more than happy to have a conversation. I, I think that's, this is why we do this. And again, maybe I, maybe I'm seeing this incorrectly. Um, I just feel we need to be, we as trustees, uh, mayors, uh, mayor pro tems, we need to be able to have that open, <clears throat> that open form of dialogue with our friends and neighbors and, and the rest of our community. 
uh, Trustee yeah. Birma. I would just add to that when it comes to social media is it can become really tricky is when are you representing yourself and when are you representing yourself as a trustee and leaving that pretty open-ended for people to interpret. Trustee Barella. Um, I guess I have a couple of questions. Um, so since you, uh, uh, Mayor Furman, decided to create this office hours, how do we know what's being discussed on there? Are you gonna give a written synopsis to the board? I mean, is that gonna come from each one of this in reference to this? Um, you've already had a, uh, a, I don't know, I'm gonna call it an online reservation time chat with yourself. Um, so if you're saying that's best practices for all of us, how do we know what's being discussed so that way we can either join as a unified group and have a single voice in reference to this, or um, if we have a descending opin you know, opinion, how do we know what's the best practice for that? Because you've already had one. I know I am more than willing during meetings to tell everybody that I was confronted. Be careful what mm -hmm. you wish for. Um, and who yelled at me mm -hmm. today at the post office or as I was their waitress. <laughs> so, um, I love the feedback from the public. Most of the time the engagement is positive and happy, but there are times that it is not. So um, just wondering about content in reference to that, if we did start doing those things. Um, I suppose it's up to this group to discuss uh, the office hours. I think there's plenty of precedent for um, public officials or even staff hosting office hours. Um, it's a one-on-one -on -one conversation over the phone. Uh, the The booking is online, but it's not. Um, it's not something other than a phone call or a Zoom meeting. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't see a real distinction between that and the public's ability to call or email us directly, which we all encourage. Um, so I guess I'm curious what what thoughts there are around that. I'm happy to report. Um, the topics of conversation. I'm not sure if the members of the public, you know, if there's an issue with disclosing identities of who's scheduled office hours or not, but I, I'd be happy to provide reports um, week by week. Trustee Mayor Pro Tem Barney. Thank you, Mayor. I think our discussion, so typically I'm with uh, Trustee Barella on this one in trying to fold new, uh, trying to fold into all pre already existing committees so that we don't have death by committee. Um, but hearing this discussion is making me sort of think differently about that because it doesn't sound like our area of concern is so much with the personnel communications. This sounds like a whole sort of new I don't know, like a new um, new terrain for us. And it involves like, how do we hear about what Shane, what Shane has, discusses in his office hours? I did not attend or make an appointment or, you know, a lot of that is just something, I mean, I think the social media discussion is really relevant and unclear. I think, um, the it's more what I'm hearing the communication between trustee to public and I don't know how that fits into the personnel and code committee as well. Uh, so I don't know I'd like to speak for a second on that the <clears throat> I think those are all great points and it I think there's a bunch of issues here which is why communications policy is going to be so helpful and why the scope of Lisa's presentation was so helpful. Um, my goal for all of us being accessible is to increase outlets for the community to communicate to us. Um, you know, my understanding from speaking at length with Administrator Ryder and Lisa about the purposes of and appropriateness of how to engage with the public is that we are, we're, we're supposed to be gathering um, information and then to the extent there's been something decided at the town level and public information that we're aware of because of all of the meetings that we go to, um, we can share that. But we have to be very careful what we all say um, to 
attorney Paul Kosnick's presentation, we don't wanna accidentally um, bind the town in some way or create an expectation that we promised some result to a member of the public. Um, mm -hmm. In the office hours that I did host already, I received feedback from a community member, and then I turned around and presented that feedback to Administrator Ryder <clears throat> um, and, and other staff that it was relevant to. And uh, I pretty much just listened and then engaged with, uh, with the community member by saying, I will make sure to voice this. <clears throat> to the appropriate people. And so I'm, I'm trying to just act as a conduit. And I think that as we you know, receive phone calls or emails, that's the best thing we could do is pass it along the information to the appropriate person and tell the public that they're being heard and that their information or concerns will be passed along to the rest of you know, the relevant people either on this board or among the, the town personnel. But the trouble here is with our sunshine laws. So as much as I would have liked to send a a formal update to everyone about each of the things that I engaged with this week with public that was interesting. Um, that creates a meeting if, if I send an email to everyone on this board. Instead, I just send things to Administrator Ryder and you know he then sends them out to the appropriate people. Um, and part of our commu commu communication policy perhaps will include some aggregation of the feedback we each are sending to Administrator Ryder to the rest of this group so that we're not violating some type of sun, sunshine meeting law. Any other discussion on communication policies for now? Trustee Lashley. Thank you, Mayor Furman. Um, I'd just like to say that this is a topic that um, has been discussed a lot and that I've asked um, us to come up with a more formal policy on responding to some of uh, these, uh, especially social, social media um, uh, outlets and aspects. Um, I think it's important that we try to respond on a professional level at some point, but kind of try and stay out of the, the mire of it. Um, I will say that all of the conversations that we've had about ways to engage in this have been very unproductive so far, um, probably including this one. Thank you. So any other closing thoughts on this before we move on? Transparency is key. So action items from this, are we pursuing Lisa's suggestion to create this committee or do we want to wind it up into the code committee? Trustee Harper. I think it needs to be rolled into the code committee. There's already an existing platform there. We need to roll it in. It's my opinion. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Well, Trustee Barella, Trustee Harper, and myself are, are the code committee, so it's the work will fall on us to get these policies done quickly and efficiently. So Oh, then never that's... mind. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm Lisa? going, you're right, we are. Holy crap. <laughs> Just one consideration for uh, the board as well is we're talking right now about external communication. Um, we and and internal communication but there are a lot of other things that are folded into my department as well um this doesn't even touch on marketing so i don't know if if the group wants to look at it in a broader context or if we just want to knock out the communications policy um, but that's just something else to think about so may i recommend that we have our first communication or code meeting and talk about our scope and how likely it is for us to get all this stuff done and take it on if we can and kick it out to the rest of the group if we feel like we're overwhelmed. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Yep. Thank you, Trustee Harper. Uh, Mayor Pro Tem Barney, did you have another comment? Oh, I was just gonna seek a little input from Mr. Ryder.
specifically on the, but you know what? It's solved. Forget about it. We're good. Move on. All right. So moving on to the first reading of the resolution to create a master plan committee, which was in our packet on page, starting on page 21. We don't need to have a first reading for the resolution. No, you can just vote to pass it or approve it or not. Even better. Um, any discussion on this resolution? And if not, is there a motion to approve this resolution? I can make a motion to approve it. Second. Roll call, please. Trustee Barella? No. Trustee Harper? No. Trustee Wagert? Yes. Trustee Birma? Yes. Trustee Lashley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Barney? Yes. Mayor Furman? Yes. Motion passed. Um, I'm curious from Trustee Brill and Trustee Harper, what the concern with this committee is. Trustee Brilla. I voiced it at the last meeting. Uh, would you remind everyone? There's a bunch of public attendees that weren't at the last meeting. Um, and also this was you know, done at the request of Planner Adair. And so I'm curious. At first I was in favor of it until I found out the way that the structure was gonna be and the chairperson. And so that is why I am voting no. Thank you. Trustee Harper, any input or no? Uh, Mr. Mayor, thank you so much. Um, I, I believe we discussed this at great length at our last meeting. I understand we have uh, additional attendees tonight. Um, my opinion stands as before that uh, I believe that uh, we continue to add committees and create new committees to, and, and oversight upon oversight and, and maybe more is just more. Um, I also feel that there's a transparency issue and there's possibly a conflict, but um, the resolution passed and I, I wish our board all the luck and I will participate to the best of my ability. Thank you. Um, Thank you board, we will need to appoint, now that we have created this committee, the town trustee member that is also a member of the planning commission as well as the town trustee member that is not a member of the planning commission. Um, as I stated before, I would like to chair this committee with your support. Um, and I'm curious whether uh, trustee Wiegert or trustee Harper will be the member that is from the planning commission. Trustee Wiegert. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to start a dialogue, Trustee Harper, and I'm just curious, uh, you mentioned um, a possibility of uh, maybe a, a conflict of interest as you see it in the way that the committees were presented at the last meeting. I'm just curious if you would uh, appreciate the opportunity to represent the town trustees and the planning commission on the master planning committee. May I respond? Yes, please. Trustee, uh, Trustee Wiegert, I thank you. That is awesome of you. Um, I believe that we agreed upon uh, last meeting that you would represent us and I have my full faith in you. So thank you very much for, uh, for, for stating that, but thank you, sir. Uh, I'm happy to oh, represent that position. I don't think we've had anything formally any formal appointments yet? Uh, I'm happy to fill that position, but I would like to give you the opportunity, being as you're the other trustee on the planning commission, to fill that seat. Trustee Lashley. Uh, thank you, Mayor Furman. Um, I just wanted to support that. I think that since uh, Trustee Wieger has been in the position in the planning commission and has the experience with. Uh, with the planning process that um, that I think he would be a great addition to the planning committee. Um, and I, I, 
I really do think that that um, that he would be the the best person to represent us as a town trustee since um, you'll be chairing it. And I actually think that that um, not being on the planning commission, but having been on the planning commission before would take me out of the role completely um, out of the running for that completely. But um, I, I, I think that Jess would do great on that. Trustee Barella. Uh, I would like to mirror what uh, Trustee Lashley said. Um, I think Jess has enough knowledge moving forward and it can bring everything to the table that the Planning Commission has worked on for revisions for the past uh, four years of his tenure on there. So I think he is the logical choice. Thank you. So with that, by a show of hands, can we or should we do vocal? I'm not sure. Uh, in terms of formally appointing myself as chair and trustee Wiegert as the planning commission member on this new committee. All in favor? Sure. I the record, um, all but trustee Barella raised their hands. Uh, the next step will be uh, the planning committee uh, selecting their representative. Trustee Wiegert, yes. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I'd just like to acknowledge my fellow trustees and their support, and I appreciate the comments that you've made. Very kind words from all of you. Thank you. I hope to represent you all well. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Jess. Thank you, Trustee Wiegert. And thank you all. Uh, the next item on our agenda is to have the first reading of the consideration to approve extension or revision of employee RV or so first reading of employee RV ordinance is the next item on the agenda. Administrator Ryder, is that something that we specifically read through or since it's in the packet? Um, I believe we, I get to read it. Oh, wonderful. <laughs> Please take it away. If I could, just uh, this ordinance has been in place for a couple of years now, renewed annually. Uh, after some research and some review of meeting minutes when it was originally adopted, yeah, this was, uh, and I'm going to invite, I'm going to read it, and then I'm going to invite Bill McDougall to uh, Lisa Branner. I don't know if you can make him a panelist. He should be out there somewhere and just talk about some of his experience with this ordinance, but this is the same ordinance word for word as, as what has been renewed the last couple of years with one exception. In paragraph C number 10, we've reworded that uh, so that it is an ordinance in perpetuity unless specifically terminated by the board, you know, at their discretion. Does that, does that make sense? So I will read it. This is ordinance 2020-02, an ordinance to allow campers within the town for the purpose of housing qualified employees on a temporary seasonal basis. Whereas the town of Silverton has adopted regulations related to occupancy and un unoccupied storage of camper vehicles in the municipal code chapter seven, article two, section 7-2-17 campers and whereas the occupancy of recreational vehicle campers within the town is allowed only as a convenience for visiting friends and relatives or during construction of a dwelling unit. And whereas campers may be parked for occupancy on or adjacent to occupied residential property for a total of 20 camper days per calendar year. <clears throat> and whereas there currently exists a shortage, shortage of rental housing for employees during the busy summer tourist season and whereas business owners have requested that the Board of Trustees assist in finding workable solutions that meet the housing needs of seasonal employees, and whereas campers parked on private residential property may offer suitable seasonal housing alternatives for some employees without unduly impacting other neighborhood residents, and whereas the Board of Trustees deem it in the best interest of the town to allow the occupancy of campers for seasonal housing on a temporary basis, now, therefore, be it ordained by the Board of Trustees of the Town of Silverton that Section 7-2-17 Campers A. Occupancy. The occupancy of campers within the town for visiting friends and families is limited to a total 
of 20 camper days per calendar year. B, exception for qualified employees. The occupancy of campers within the town for qualified employees is allowed from May 15th to October 15th. That should be 2020 instead of 2019. I'll make that correction. Without any limitation to the number of days, all qualified employees must submit an application to the town that includes the following. Authorization, property owner shall provide written permission for employee to park a camper on their property. Number two, employee verification. Employer shall provide written verification that the person is employed at least 30 hours a week or for four days a week. If the person is self-employed, then a business license or other document demonstrating employment shall be deemed acceptable for purposes of verifying the employment requirements. Paragraph C, restrictions for campers for qualified employees. All campers for qualified employees are subject to the following restrictions. One, vehicle types, RVs, motorhomes, specifically types A, B, and C, fifth wheel trailers and truck campers are permitted. Teardrop trailers, tent campers, vans, tents, and yurts are prohibited. Zoning, allowed as a temporary use in R1, R1A, R2, and ED zones, and prohibited in BP and P zones. Density, one <clears throat> RV slash camper per 2,500 square feet of lot area. Four, setbacks. RV camper shall be parked entirely on private property and shall comply with all setbacks. Five, license. RVs and campers shall have a current vehicle license. Six, facilities. RV campers shall be fully self-contained and holding tanks shall be emptied on a regular basis at an approved dump station. Seven, noise. No generators or loud noises are allowed before 8 a.m. or after 9 p.m. Eight, trash. Campers shall be required to pay the town's transfer station fee and the property shall be kept neat and free of trash slash rubbish accumulation. Nine, permit. RVs and campers shall be issued a town permit to be placed inside the front windshield of the vehicle. Number 10, expiration. This ordinance shall remain in full force and effect unless otherwise amended or terminated by the Town of Silverton Board of Trustees. And that is the first reading. Trustee Barella. Um, so I guess my only issue is on section, um, it's B, it's letter B. Um, it says May 15th to October 15th. Why are we dating it if we want it to be an open-ended item? Um, is it just because you're trying to say it, it starts again this year, even though we thought we passed it last year? Well, I think we're just establishing what the summer season is. Okay, but then does it need the year date on it then? I guess would be my question. No, I, I think you're right. We could take the year out entirely. Good suggestion. Trustee Lashley. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have a little bit of a problem with uh, having it uh, May 15th to October 15th. I think our summer season is growing and I think that limiting it to from May 15th to October 15th is limiting us a little bit. Um, I guess you could limit it more to like May 1st through October 31st, but I mean, the, the train runs longer than those, than those times uh, into town. And then I'm also curious as to the zoning restrictions on here and curious if that was in the past prohibiting um, people camping in DP and P zone. It, it, it was a say, yeah, this is the same ordinance we've been renewing annually. So it was restricted in previous ordinances. Trustee Barella. Um, to your to your question, um, Trustee Lashley, I do believe it had to do with the way that the other camper parks in town were open. And that was based on, I believe, um, water freezing. And that was why May 15th to October 15th was the primary um, issuance for those dates just due to water. Um, so that's to be the best of my understanding for when this started, what about uh, I want to say four years ago. It's been I a while. So. Yeah. Trustee Lashley. Yeah, I, I 
have a, still, I guess, take a little bit of issue with it. Uh, Silverton is one of the shortest gardening seasons uh, in the country and historically the shortest in the state. It's about 30 frost free days a year. So um, I, I'm not sure that that's really a great thing. And I'm, I'm sure that um, kind of in the past that some places have uh, gotten away, maybe because their neighbors didn't complain and such. Um, but I've definitely noticed business owners in the DP district um, living in their campers uh, all summer long and uh, doing it before May 15th and after October 15th. So I'm not sure if we should reflect that or kind of deal with those as they come in as an ordinance uh, for enforcement. And if I could, if it pleases the board to have uh, Building Inspector McDougal speak to this, um, just to give his perspective. Yes, please. Guys, um, obviously my job as code officer is, into, is to enforce whatever ordinance you folks pass and however you determine it works is fine. Um, I guess my only significant input here, it's a difficult ordinance to interpret, to enforce, because if someone is camping or staying in someone's property, um, some of the issues are, are they working in town? I can go around and get the forms. I have those in my file. Uh, and have them filled out appropriately. Um, I do think it might be prudent to, to keep the prohibition in the BP zone, but again, that is your guys' decision. Um, that was put in there simply because BP is a very crowded zone with no setbacks, and there really are very few spots where you could actually put an RV and meet the setback requirements. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, to answer your question, this was passed for the first time in 2015. So it, it goes back almost five, this might be the sixth year. Um, but it, it um, there was a, I did do a little research as to input from campground owners. And of the three campground owners I, I um, were able to communicate with and I did not uh, contact Silver Summit. Um, one had uh, kind of a neutral to where he, he didn't feel there was a problem with this ordinance. And the other two campground owners felt that this was not an appropriate ordinance to pass because of the competition aspects that um, they feel it does provide against their business that, uh, and certainly three of your business owners in town that are on the board here um, might feel uncomfortable if you had someone competing with no real overhead in whatever business you had. And that was a comment from two of the three campground owners that I did contact. And I had a similar conversation with one of the campground owners who you know, specifically spoke to the competition and it, you know, this, this ordinance potentially hurts their business. Trustee Brella. So I do believe this was just strictly meant to identify for temporary housing for employees. You have to be able to have a, a rentable space for them either on your property or um, it, it wasn't meant to put somebody into a camper park because they couldn't afford the rents. It was meant that those are full during our peak seasons and you're allowing a worker that possibly works for you. I utilize this. I will be more than happy to tell you all the experience. Um, I had a very lovely young lady who um, couldn't find housing. She had already worked for me previously. She wanted to come back and all she had was her camper trailer. And we put her up out here in the driveway. We have full hookups, electricity, water, sewer. And she was appreciative of it, but she actually did pay to be here to use the electricity and the water and so on. And it was um, just a supplemental housing to what she had. The camper parks, this is why this was created, already had 100% um, occupancy during times where she needed to be here. So I understand the thinking back in 2015 because it's a very useful thing. We're trying not to be in competition. Of course, if you have a reservation, especially this year, that can go to uh, Silver Summit or A&B or... Um, 
Red Mountain, <laughs> of course you want to send those, you, you know, your employees potentially there. But when they're booked up at 100% occupancy during uh, June, July, August, where are your employees going to stay when they brought their camper here for just that reason? So that was what the whole thing was. This year's different. Mayor Pro Tem Barney. Okay, so also there's a 20 day camper limit on this. So no, am I wrong about that? That's if that, they're not your employee. That's just for visitors and friends. Okay, yeah, so an employee gets a special um, exemption there, mm -hmm. right? That's okay. correct. Sorry. Trustee Lashley. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I think that this is uh, a very helpful ordinance to address the shortage of housing that we face in the summertime for seasonal employees um, during our busy time. Um, I don't, I, I guess I have a question for Bill McDougall as to how many times that this has been an issue uh, for certain for you as a code enforcer, um, I, I think it's it's every year that this has kind of come up for us, we've said that this is a good thing and that we should keep doing it. Um, but if we're gonna make this permanent, I feel like um, we need to kind of dot our I's and cross our T's here and make sure that we're doing the best we can for the seasonal employees and the business owners to utilize this. And there's not very many of them um, who do, but, it, but for those, who, it do, who this ordinance does cover, it's, it's tremendously helpful for them to be able to use it. And I don't think it takes away from the businesses of the RV parks during our busy peak season at all. Um, there were uh, four open spots at the monthly RV park that was approved by the town board three years ago, uh, all last summer. And there are no, res there's only one reservation out of the five spots there. So actually there were openings the last two summers under the new ownership at that spot at the corner of uh, Ninth and Mineral. Um, and in speaking to another RV owner, he doesn't feel there's gonna be a lot of business this summer, as I'm sure you guys understand that better than anybody. And he will have monthly rentals available at his RV park also. Those are the comments I received. Trustee Brella. Um, and I concur, Bill. I believe that this year is special, but on regular years, um, I'm telling you, I've had, um, not only one, I've had two different employees use this. I just gave you one example and she could not find anything. So it's it's a half a dozen of one, it's a half a dozen of the other. This year is special. We are, we are dealing with something that we've never dealt with before. This is unprecedented times that we're living in. Um, I'd rather see you all in person and, and but we can't obviously. So um, I don't think that we should allow this, an unprecedented time to take away from what we know has been helpful um, to to our staffing, um, and I'm and I'm sure it's more to uh, Trustee Lashley and myself because we have a higher need for employees during that time frame, and a lot of the employees that come they can't afford to pay the twelve hundred dollars a month. Um, to rent a camper space and then pay for the electricity and so on and so forth, you know. So uh, I, I don't want this year's actions of the virus to take away what potentially is something good for uh, the future of employees until we can get additional housing that allows for that kind of six month attrition cycle of people coming through. Because this typically is only used in um, obviously the summertime based on the ordinance because we don't have the housing. Thank you. Trustee Weigert. I just wanna echo what Trustee Barilla just said. This is a supplement for workforce housing and it's for people who are fulfilling the lower income jobs in our community. And I think this is a necessity. And with that said, I'd like to make a motion Hey, Jess, I'm sorry, Trustee Weigert. I just have a quick question before we move to a motion, which um, I agree with everyone. I think this is important workforce housing. My question is, I don't see anything in here restricting or speaking about fees. 
And I think since the intent is to provide housing um, for free potentially to uh, employees that can't otherwise afford it, as Trustee Barella said, um, besides the cost of trash, which I see is uh, one of the requirements, should there be something included in here about the inability of property owners to charge anything other than electricity usage or other things, just so that we know that there aren't people treating this more like a business and actually competing with the RV parks? Trustee Barella? Um, I know you just posed this question, but I do want to revisit uh, what Trustee Lashley was saying about potentially the, were you talking about the BP? Okay, so go ahead with yours and then we can segue into mine. So again, just to quickly restate my question is, should there be something in this ordinance that um, imposes a restriction that property owners can't charge, you know, some amount for the use of this space um, so that they aren't actually competing as a business against the RV parks and that they are in fact providing workforce housing for free or at least below market prices. And that's a question. I don't, I don't know the answer there. Trustee Harper. Hey, sorry. I'm just reading over my notes from uh, last week's chamber meeting uh, that we had last Wednesday and uh, several of the uh, RV park owners said that they're getting flooded. They're getting inundated with reservations. And I don't, I don't feel that there may be a problem. Trustee Lashley. Uh, thank you, Mayor Furman. To your question, um, that's hard, but you know, I think that the density portion of it helps kind of keep some of that concern down. Um, I don't know how the other trustees feel about it, but I feel like it's kind of understood that this is kind of a good Samaritan uh, ordinance that we have. And if we did see some violations of it, or if we we felt like people were being treated unfairly um, and, and we're hearing complaints from potential employees, maybe maybe then it would be worthwhile to revisit this ordinance and modify it. Um, I have one thing that maybe rather than prohibiting BP zoning, if we could have uh, a special setback requirement for BP zoning that might help certain business owners who do that way you know maybe keep it on the back half of the property in a bp zone so those few people who who do utilize that can can utilize it trustee Weigert, did you have a question or a comment just don't appreciate getting cut off when i have the floor and uh, i really feel like we're beating this one to death we've got a long meeting ahead of us an executive session and i'm ready to move forward Trustee Barella. Um, I like Trustee Lashley's um, comment about the BP zone, changing it potentially to um, a back half of a property, not, not facing on Main Street. Um, because we do know that there are individuals that have no other place to be and they're trying to run their business on their property in the BP zone. So I agree with that, Trustee Lashley. Administrator Ryder, is there any other guidance to the questions and comments we've made that you'd like? Uh, only to confirming, are you, do you want to add something for the BP zone or not? You don't think we've answered the question? Bill, do you have anything to add on that? Well, I just no. Other than as as a code officer, I just want to make sure whatever you guys vote on, it's clear enough to, to make it uh, enforceable. Or I've been hearing a lot of different ideas. So, if we're gonna if we're gonna make some changes, um, you need to do it obviously formally tonight before the first reading, or or read it so that that we have some idea of exactly what direction we're going in. Trustee Brella. Sorry, I'll let Trustee Barney go first. Thank you, Trustee Barella. I think this is a really important thing for workforce housing. I'm totally with everyone on making it as available as possible for business owners. And if um, 
adjusting the setbacks can make it available in the BP zone in a way that's manageable for Mr. McDougal, then I think that's that just adds to the supply. So I think that sounds like a, a good idea. Trustee Lashley. Sorry to keep keep up with this one too. The other thing that I'm seeing in his in here is we don't really have a lot of teeth in here to enforce it as far as if, if there are complaints. Um, you know, I, I would like to see one thing on here that, you know, outlines first complaint is a warning, second complaint, um, it comes with a, I, I, I don't know, some kind of teeth and then third, um, third, it, it, you're out, you know, uh, I think that would be a, a good thing to put on here. And then rather than prohibiting it in the BP to restrict it to the rear half of the property or the further away from Green Street, it gets basically. Trustee Brella. So I'd like to make a motion encompassing. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, Sally. Go ahead. Sorry. I just wondered, we, um, I, I, I understand the idea of taking the date out because I think it's just defining the summer season, but this has seemed like a pretty productive revision session to that document. And I wonder if it does need to come up for a review every year that that's maybe a good thing and can keep us on course for I don't know, tweaking it as it needs to be tweaked before we are totally finished. Any thoughts or opinions there? Trustee Lashley. Uh, that was certainly our thoughts and opinions in the past, but I think that uh, Trustee Wiegert's uh, concerns about, you know, spending this amount of time on this kind of uh, uh, ordinance year after year is, is maybe a little tedious for the town board to keep going through too when we pretty much approve it with small tweaks every year. Um, I think maybe revisiting it if we have problems is probably a better thing and making this a little bit more permanent so that we don't have to have this discussion again. Thank you. Trustee Brella. Hey, so I'd like to make a uh, motion to uh, accept ordinance number 202002. Sorry, I don't have my glasses on. Ordinance to allow campers within the town for purposes of housing qualified employees on a temporary and seasonal basis, including the changes made to B, removing the date of 2019, and removing on. Um, on two under C that it prohibits it in the BP zone except for in the back half of a property and I'd like to add a number 11 issuing the warnings uh, for enforcement. Do we have a second? Trustee Lashley. I'll, I'll second that. Sorry, I was having trouble finding my mute button. Roll call, please. Trustee Barella? Yes. Trustee Harper? Yes. Trustee Weigert? Yes. Trustee Beerma? Yes. Trustee Lashley? Yes. Mayor for Tim Barney? Yes. Mayor Furman? Yes. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the Mountain Annie's application uh, for the renewal of their retail marijuana license. Um, it was my understanding that the only thing holding this up was uh, some paperwork issues that I've been told have been resolved, but I'll defer to Administrator Ryder. And I guess before that, Trustee Barella. That was gonna be my question, if they satisfied everything from the last meeting. They have, and I will tell you that Attorney Kosnick has also been very involved in this process and has given it his blessing. Please. Trustee Rilla. So I'd like to make a motion to accept the marijuana retail operation license application for Mountain Annie's LLC. Do we have a second? Second. Thank you, Trustee Lashley. 
Roll call, please. Trustee Brella? Yes. Trustee Harper? Yes. Trustee Waggert? Yes. Trustee Bearma? Yes. Trustee Lashley? Yes. Mayor Pro Tem Bernie? Yes. Mayor Furman? Yes. Thank you. Um, now we move to our second public or third this evening public comment. And we do have a hand raised by Mr. David Breed, uh, who I'm going to give permission to speak now. Mr. Breed, if you unmute yourself, you have the floor. Do you unmute yourself? Yes, you hi. Hello, good evening. I, um, hi, we hear I you. just wanted to make a comment about the Facebook. Hi, Could, hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, <laughs> Furman, the yes, thumbs up. You. Great, listen, um, the, the whole Facebook th th page thing is a bit overblown. It's, uh, it, it, it's a way for you folks to be able to put a post up and turn off commenting. I've offered Lisa Branner and everybody the opportunity to be a moderator so you can make a post and then shut it off. And so it's, if it's an official post from the sheriff from uh from the PIO from from uh you know from anyone you can just use it as a way to get information out to the public and that's that's communication and so you don't have to engage in a back and forth in in this toxic and crazy world and I agree it's crazy this is not entirely productive and and that's not what anybody wants so I would hope that 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 you could uh use it as a way to get community feedback, as a way to to understand what the community is feeling about. Albert has obviously, uh, uh, you know, been very vocal. And, um, and that's, you know, that, that it hasn't always been constructive. But to hear from the public is a First Amendment thing. And so you guys can make a post, the sheriff can make a post, whoever can make a post, and then shut off the commenting. And then and then just say that's an official post. And so it's not a matter of whether it's the Facebook thing that that the breed has. Uh, I, I started that simply to improve communication within the community you know, six years ago. I have no financial interest in it. I have no uh, other interest in it than open communication under the First Amendment. And so so you, you, you don't have to get into toxic back and forth, um, uh, obviously. If you had a, a town employee or a county employee that that was, you know, off the reservation and, and posting things, that's that's not constructive and not good for for you folks as professionals. But as in terms of just communication, you know, people keep saying the Silverton standard. That's great. It comes out once a week. It's 2020, folks. You know, just just you can use these outlets and you can use them appropriately or we can use them appropriately and you can shut off the commenting that's perfectly fine there's nothing wrong with that you know just as information is information get information out and deal with it but it's become a personal thing where people are thinking that there's that there's some uh, untoward you know uh, uh control or something like that i i don't care i can turn it over to lisa branner you know i don't whatever there's 5,000 people that are listening. A lot of them are not from this community and that's talk that can be toxic. And we're trying, it, it, there's no financial motive for me. There's no anything like that. I just Thank you, want Mr. to- Thank you, Mr. Reed, we're, we're, we're over three minutes. Reed, we're Sorry. Three minutes. Sorry. Um, but thank you for your comment. We appreciate it. Um, thank you for your comment. We appreciate it. Um, at this point, I would entertain, unless there are any other public comments, I don't see any hands raised in the Zoom meeting, I would entertain a motion to enter executive session. Trustee Lashley. I'd like to make a motion to enter executive session for the purpose of determining positions relative to matters that may be subject to negotiations, developing strategy for negotiations and or instructing negotiators under CRS section 24-6-402-4, 
uh, 4E concerning Silverton Lakes wetland mitigation and to le receive legal advice under CRS 24-6-4024B. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Um, so at this point, uh, the public will be excused from this meeting. Um, you're welcome to rejoin the meeting after the end of executive session, um, but the only purpose of rejoining the meeting uh, will be to listen to us adjourn the regular meeting. Um, Lisa Branner will now close out any participants in the virtual meeting, and this meeting will be locked out to participants while the board is in the executive session. Uh, we'll take a quick break while Lisa confirms that this is accomplished, and uh, Lisa will turn over hosting to John and we'll then exit the meeting and John will begin recording the executive session. Okay, bear with me. I'm going to shut the live stream down first and then I'll come back and deal with anyone who is lingering. If you are an attendee in the meeting, feel free to uh, leave the meeting yourself while I do that or I will boot you out when I get back here. Okay, there's Paul. <clears throat> Hi, Paul. Hey, sorry, I had it on mute there. Couldn't figure it out. I don't, I don't know if you guys saw a little while ago, my sister walked over and brought me a whole tray of food that my mom made for dinner. I know, it's crazy. And I've been staring at it the whole time and taking little bites of cucumber. But now it's now it's celery with cucumber. My mom thinks I'm unhealthy. 